Well, this morning is an invitation service. Our title is Man's Folly, God's Mercy. And I want us to, to look at that passage we read this morning from 1 Kings, which is about this man Adonijah and his attempt to take the throne of Israel. Now, some might wonder why I want to speak from a passage which, at first sight, perhaps doesn't seem to have much to say to us today. It's uh, from over 2,000 years ago, and yet the Bible makes it clear, you see, that it is God's timeless word. The Bible says this, as it speaks of the Old Testament, really of the whole of Scripture, whatever things were written before were written for our learning. And the Bible describes accurately human nature, because it's written by God, who knows man better than man knows himself. You only need to read through this book, and you are struck by how powerful, how heart-searching, and by how accurate it is as it describes our condition. And throughout its pages, it directs us to the greatest problem that we have and the wondrous answer that God has given to that problem, which is found in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. From Genesis to Revelation, man's need of salvation is made clear. That need we have to be saved from sin's penalty and also from its power over us. And we see that this morning in 1 Kings, 1 Kings 1. Here in Adonijah, we see man's folly, man's folly. And yet we're also pointed to God's mercy, to God's mercy. Well, firstly, we see our first point is this. Adonijah exalts himself. Adonijah exalts himself. It's a time of change in Israel. King David now is declining physically. And the question is being asked, who is now going to follow on and become king. We know David has several sons, and we know that it's David's desire and God's will that Solomon should become king. David has already made it quite clear that Solomon will build the temple, and Solomon can only do that if he is going to be king over the nation. Yet it seems here that Adonijah will ignore his father's will, and he'll ignore God's will, and he won't allow any process of succession to take place. He's not even the eldest. He'll neither submit to what God says in his word or to what his father says. And we read in verse 5, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. I will be king. Decide he's going to snatch the throne, He's not concerned really about what God wants or what God's will is. And he immediately seeks to stake his claim and ride roughshod over anyone who might stand in his way. And we read there that he prepared for himself chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. He's got his own entourage and he's got his own bodyguard. Now some might make excuses for Adonijah. We read in verse 6, his father had not rebuked him at any time by saying, what have you done? His father had failed to discipline Adonijah, really, as he should. David, though he was a picture of Christ, he was also a frail man who had his failings, as all men do. And yet, really, we can't excuse Adonijah. He clearly thinks highly of himself. Verse 6 says he was very good looking. His mother had born Adonijah him after Absalom. Now we know Absalom was also one who'd rebelled against his father and again was one who thought very much of himself and uh, was a very good looking man, had this lovely hair, Absalom. And uh, Adonijah is like him. And you see, in seeking to take the throne, Adonijah is sinning. You see what he's doing? He's deciding to act without reference to God or with any concern as to what God desires and what God's will is. And, do you know, in many ways, if ever we wanted a good description of what sin is, we have it there in verse 5. Adonijah exalted himself. 
saying, I will be king. We see there great pride and an arrogance, an independency of God leading to rebellion against what God wanted. And that's what sin is, really. We can think of Eve in the garden. She thought that God was withholding something from her that she should have. She thought she knew better than God, and she decided, therefore, to go against the will and the commandments of God. And you see, that's what sin is. We do not want to do what God wants, what God desires. We think we know better, and we exalt ourselves. We want to be king of our lives. We want to be king. We don't want God to be king. We don't want God to tell us what to do. We don't want God to be on the throne of our lives. We want to be free to do what we want to do. We don't want to be hemmed in by God. And we don't want anything that might restrict us or make us feel that we can't do exactly as we please. We want to go our own way. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And we say, well, who has any right to tell me what to do anyway? It's my life. I'll live it as I please. We make ourselves king. We put ourselves on the throne. We exalt ourselves. That's what sin is. We know that uh, much of politics, not all of politics, but much of politics can play up to this, can't it? We need people's votes, often they say, and they think, well, to get their votes, we must give them what they want. Whether or not it's according to God's commandments, it doesn't matter. And you know, there is one thing today that will make someone utterly unacceptable in politics and generally in society if they speak of the need to honour God, or they speak of God, or of following God's ways and God's commandments. Really, that's what powers the theory of evolution. It's not good science. Evolution is poor science. What moves it is man's desire to do away with God and to have self-rule, for self to be on the throne, like Adonijah. In our own lives, we can do the same. The Bible says that every one of us is convicted by conscience. Our conscience speaks to us of the fact that there is a God, there's a just God, and uh, creation speaks to us, and yet we refuse to acknowledge God. We refuse to obey God. We are on the throne of our lives. I want what I want, and I'll go my own way. Terrible, isn't it? Because the Bible says, you see, God is our maker. We own our very life, we own our very breath to this God. He even holds our life in his hand now. And yet, though we're made to know him and serve him, we prefer our own way, we exalt ourselves, we want to be king of our own lives. And so we resist this glorious God. But having seen Adonijah exalting himself, we then see, secondly, Adonijah's encouragement. Verse 7, then he conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they followed and helped Adonijah. This is a startling verse, really, in this passage, because, you see, Joab was a great and mighty man and one of David's trusted lieutenants. He'd remained faithful to David throughout his reign. Abiathar was one of the two chief priests, and again, he'd been faithful to David at critical moments. Now, Adonijah, he consults with these two men, and rather than discouraging him, as they should have done, they encourage him. For what reason? We're not told. We know that Joab is eventually exposed as a very scheming man. Perhaps Abiathar has become gripped by the same desire. We're not really sure why it was that these men acted in this way. I think Joab was really hoping he was backing the right horse, as it were, because he knew David was soon to leave this life. And you know, if we choose to rebel against God, if we choose to go the way of sin, if we choose to exalt ourselves, put ourselves on the throne, or be those who go against the commandments of God, you know, we'll find those, many others, who wish to encourage us in what we're doing. Christ said this, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. The vast majority of this world, if we look around, I'm sure I don't have to tell you, we see a world that really, the vast majority, they reject this God, they live in rebellion to God. And if you want to live life without the true and living God, you'll find many going that way, many examples that you can follow. 
with someone who refuses to acknowledge God or obey God, though he's speaking to us every day through creation, through our consciences, through his word, there are many making their way through life like that whom we can follow. You want to believe the lie of evolution? That we're just those who've come about as a result of random physical forces? There are many going that way who will encourage you in that view. You want to be considered cool and sort of in with your friends and peers who would laugh at the thought of God and being obedient to God? You're anxious that, you know, your Facebook profile shouldn't give anything away about allegiance to God or love for his word? Well, there are many who would encourage you to take such a position, to take such a view and to do such a thing. Friend, if you want to rebel against God, you'll find there are millions of companions out there in this world. The, jo the Joabs and the uh, Abiathers of this world, they'll all seek to reassure you that your course is the right one and you're doing the best thing and just come along with us, follow us. We're all going the same way and wow, all this majority, they can't be wrong, surely. We'll find there are many who will encourage us to go the way which is away from God and against God. We see Adonijah's encouragement, but then we also see, thirdly, Adonijah's success. Adonijah's success. For a while, all appears well. Adonijah and his friends, they seem to have succeeded. They've made their move. They've caught the king off guard and everyone else. And they seem to have got their grip on power. And they decide they're going to throw a big party and celebrate their achievement. Verse 9, And Adonijah sacrificed sheep and oxen and fat, fatted cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is in Enrogel. He also invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. And you know, the life of sin, the life of rebellion against God, does appear at first to be very successful in many ways. That's what it seems to so many today. We live our lives for ourselves. We refuse to acknowledge God. We refuse to be reconciled to God or submit ourselves to God. And we prosper. We prosper. We enjoy good lives, prosperity. We seem happy. We seem content. Lots of smiling faces. The party goes on. We know that many make their gods of pleasure and of entertainment and of uh, wealth and they don't give any thought to God, they're happy to go against God, they're happy to break the commandments of God. The thought of being obedient to God is furthest from their minds. And they seem to know nothing by way of difficulty or hardship, many. That's one of the problems, isn't it, in Psalm 73. The psalmist says there that he's struggling with the fact that the wicked seem to do so well and they seem to get on so prosperously. And you can think about Elijah rebelling, thinking about rebelling. He knows he shouldn't. He knows he shouldn't go against his father and against the, word, uh, the will of God. And yet in the, end for it, in the end, he goes for it and he makes himself king. And the amazing thing is once he rebelled, it seemed everything was going well. God didn't immediately strike him down. It wasn't a bolt of lightning that came and sort of struck Adonijah down for a while all seemed to go well it seemed that he carried it off they were congratulating themselves how foolish he was to have hesitated and not gone for it perhaps before and you see today people will show all manner of rebellion towards God they go against God they can mock God they can blaspheme God they go against his commandments sometimes in the most perverse ways they may have felt convinced at one time or troubled, but in the end they throw it all off and all restraint is gone. What happens? Are they struck by lightning? Are they hit by a great calamity? Well, no, it often seems that there's no one to reckon with. There's no judgment to fear. God seems to either be ignorant of their sin or careless about what they're doing. Well, how different the truth is, really. Because fourthly, we see Adonijah's humiliation. 
at Anija's humiliation. We can imagine the noise and the festivity at Adonijah's party. They toast the new king. They celebrate his rise to the throne. Long live King Adonijah. Perhaps they sang the uh, Hebrew of, for he's a jolly good fellow. We don't know. It doesn't record that there. But then suddenly, above the noise of the party, they hear another noise. Verse 14, now Adonijah, sorry, verse 41, now Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they finished eating. And when Joab heard the sound of the horn, he said, what is the, why is the city in such a noisy uproar? What they don't realize, you see, is that God has used Bathsheba and Nathan to overturn Adonijah's plans. Through their actions, David has anointed the rightful king and given him the throne, the man God desired as to be ruler over his people. And the news comes to them, and what terrible news it is. Solomon is going up in glorious procession to the throne. We can imagine their faces. We get some description of the reaction, the fear, the shock. Verse 49, so all the guests who were with Adonijah were afraid and arose, and each one went his way. Suddenly they all started to melt away, all these supporters of Adonijah. The Bible acknowledges that there is a pleasure to sin, there's a passing pleasure. It's only for a season, though, you see. The season may vary in its length. It can be very long, sometimes it can be very short, but it will come to an end. The Bible warns us it will come to an end. Our rebellion, the pleasures we might enjoy as we rebel against God, as we go against the commandments of God, it will in the end come to an end. And while Adonijah and his friends were enjoying themselves, Solomon and David were preparing to deal with them. And, you know, we may ignore God. We may refuse to humble ourselves and come to God and seek God's mercy. And yet, you know, the laws of God remain unchanged. And God has not forgotten. We may ignore God, but in the end, God won't ignore us. The Bible warns us there's a God with whom we all have to do. In other words, there's a God with, all, with whom all of us must one day stand before. This world is in rebellion to God in the main, and it seems to be going on okay. And yet, do you know, there is something that is coming. Solomon went up in procession to be made king, and justice was coming to Adonijah. And you know, the Bible warns us that God's justice is getting nearer and nearer. God's justice and his judgment is getting nearer and nearer. And we cannot escape from God. The procession, if you like, of God's reckoning and God's judgment is getting nearer every day. And we're powerless to prevent it, like Adonijah. We can't prevent this reckoning that there will be. And the fact that in the end, that troubled conscience, that guilt that we felt, the way that God spoke to us, showing us that there was a judgment day that was coming, that day will come. Hebrews 9.27 says, And it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. Notice how quickly Adonijah's fair-weather friends deserted him. How quickly they melted away. When it comes to the crunch, when we face difficulty, when we face leaving this world, you know, we can often find that those things that we look to prove very little comfort to us, very little help. The things that we were looking to, the things we were putting first, prove to be very empty. When we face sad things, when we face tragic things, when we face difficulties, will the idea that we're just dust and gas, that we're just a result of evolution, will that comfort us then? Those friends we were so fearful about falling out with, if we truly followed God, will they be able in the end to help us, to enable us to stand before God? 
Here you see a higher authority works against Ad Adonijah. A higher authority, it's God, is working against him. And we must be warned, there is a higher authority who will deal with us and will call us to an account in the end. Yet having seen man's folly in Adonijah, wonderfully we are pointed to, fifthly and finally, God's mercy. God's mercy. Adonijah realises his situation is utterly hopeless. What is he to do? How can he be spared? This man who has rebelled so badly against God. Verse 50. Now Adonijah was afraid of Solomon, so he arose and went and took hold of the horns of the altar. And it was told Solomon, saying, Indeed, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon, for look, he has taken hold of the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Adonijah asks for mercy, and he clings to the altar, the horns of the altar. What was the altar? Well, it was the place where the sacrifices for sin were made. It's the place where God revealed his justice, his anger towards sin, in that the sacrifice was burnt, picturing his wrath. And yet it was also the place, really, of mercy, because a substitute could be sacrificed in your place according to the law of God, showing that your sins could be dealt with through the substitute who suffered on the altar. And, you know, this is all really a picture. The altar in the Old Testament is really a picture of the cross. It's a picture of Calvary, where the Lord Jesus Christ died on that cross. And there you see that cross, it shows us the anger of God towards our rebellion, towards our sin. It shows us that God is angry with us because we behave like Adonijah. We might be somebody who's very kind, very nice, very moral. We generally live a life that's not got marked sins in it. And yet, you know, even then in our hearts, we don't want to obey God. We don't want to submit to God. We don't want to do the will of God. Really, we have exalted ourselves. We're just like Adonijah. We want to be king. And it's offensive in the sight of God. Outwardly, we might appear a very nice person, very moral person. But in our hearts, God sees our hearts and he sees the rebellion that is there, the refusal to humble ourselves, the refusal to come to him for mercy. And God's angered by that. God's angered that we're willing to go our own way and follow our own path. And we see that anger that God displays to such rebellion there at the cross as he punishes sin in Christ. And yet wonderfully we see the grace and the mercy of God in that he punishes his son in the place of sinners so that all who look to him, all who trust in him can know his mercy and know his forgiveness. Adonijah clings to that which is really a picture of the great work that God would do through the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's wonderful how God has sent his son into this world to die for the Adonijahs of this world. Those who would, left to themselves, and who once did go their own way and desire to just go the way of sin and rebellion towards God and didn't want to have God on the throne of their hearts and their lives, but wanted themselves to be on the throne and wanted to do what they wanted to do and go their own way. God sent his son into this world for such. And it's wonderful that through Christ, that one and only true sacrifice for sin, the final, the complete sacrifice for sin that has been given, is through Christ we can look to him, we can cling to him. Nothing in my hand I bring simply to the cross. I cling. We don't cling to the altar. We cling to that which the altar pictures we look to the Lord Jesus Christ we realize we are sinners we cry for mercy like Adonijah we realize that we are those who deserve the wrath of the king and yet we look to Christ and we see the amazing provision of God that he's given his son to that death that all who look to him and trust in him can be forgiven 
and can know peace with God and be put right with God and know the wrath of God is removed from them. Is that your experience today, my friend? Do you know this peace with God? Have you been put right with God through the person and work of Christ? There is no other hope. There's no other way. There's no other way that we can be put right with God. And it's our greatest need. It's our greatest need to have eternal life, to be reconciled to God. Oh, if we resist, if we refuse, God's justice is on the road. God's justice is coming down the track. And we will know it in the end if we refuse. But oh, that we can truly know this God, truly have a relationship with God. Be brought to know peace with God. Have all our sin and rebellion forgiven. We can be freed from the power of sin. It's wonderful what God does. No longer know sin as our master. And we can live for God's glory. We can be given new life. We can be given a new heart. And know what it is to walk with God and enjoy God. And have that certain hope of knowing that were we to leave this life, we will go to be with God. And be in his presence. God is calling you today, my friend. He's calling you today. He's shown you his mercy today. And that you can hear once more this appeal to come to Christ. To come to know him and know his salvation. Will you submit to him? Will you humble yourself? In the end, Adonijah had to humble himself. Will you humble yourself? Acknowledge your need? Will you look to Christ? Turn from your rebellion and sin and cast yourself completely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Will you ignore your greatest need, which is to be reconciled to God? Oh, what mercy God is willing to show if only we would humble ourselves and receive it. May there be none so foolish to think that we can just continue in our rebellion. We can just go on exalting ourselves, putting self on the throne, refusing to do what God would have us do, refusing to submit to God and to submit to Christ. We will never prosper in the end. May we all be those who've known what it is to come to God and to humble ourselves and to look to Christ and therefore be those who have known the mercy and the grace of God and rejoice in it and so are seeking to live for his glory. For his name's sake we ask. Amen.